the Reverend Canon Susan Bell, and it's my pleasure to have served at St. Martin in the Fields for many years as the associate priest here. I think that the people and places that you meet along your journey really form you. And having spent a lot of time in the parish, I think it's had a tremendous shaping influence on me. Some of that is about the warm and loving community that we share here at St. Martin's. Some of that is about the worship of God. But not least, some of that is about the art and architecture of this building. Let me show you what I mean. Why don't you come inside and see what I see? Here we are at the west end of the nave. And this here is the baptismal font that traveled with the parish from our original site on Perth Avenue in 1913. Here you can see that it's covered in beautiful carving with the Holy Spirit, the dove, um, portrayed on, on the front. If you look up just above the font, what you'll see is something special. This is a piece of art commissioned by the parish for our centennial in 1990. And it's called Hic Spiritus Est, Here is the Spirit. I love how this sculpture welcomes us in at the physical and the spiritual entrance to the church, and then blesses us again as we leave the church. It's in the shape of outstretched arms. And it reminds us to carry the love of Christ with us both into the church and out into the world. It's also rather wonderful as it draws our eyes upwards again to the great west window. This is a very special window with deep roots in our parish history. It was made by the Robert McCausland Stained Glass Company, which is still one of the oldest stained glass companies in North America. And it's a fine example of that company's work. They're really well known for their beautiful composition and jewel tones, and we see that in our window as well. This window was commissioned by the parish as a tribute to the service of those who fought in the Great War. You can see the War Service Memorial over here on the wall. There were 16 men from this parish who died in the Great War, and that's a huge percentage. The theme of the window is of sacrifice. The sacrifice of the members of this parish who fought for king at that time and country is reflected in the sacrifice of the one who died for us and who is present in the Eucharist each week. The middle panel, is of Christ on the cross, with Jerusalem in the distance and the image of, of night descending. On the left, you can see St. John with the Virgin Mary in the garden on the right. And above St. John and the Blessed Virgin Mary are two angels. One holds the host in one hand, and the other points to the body of Christ, indicating this is the body of Christ here and here is the host in my hand. The other angel holds a chalice of consecrated wine, the blood of Christ. At the bottom of all three panels is a banner, and that's held by two more angels. And on it are the words that the priest says when administering communion according to the Book of Common Prayer. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. The window was dedicated when the upper church was built. And what's interesting here is the interplay between the sculpture below and the window above. Christ with his arms stretched out upon the cross and the impression of outstretched arms crafted using nails. Nails usually in the context of the crucifixion as symbols of suffering, but redeemed as symbols of love in this work of art. Now, as I say, we are a sacramentally centered parish and, and that orientation I think is writ large in our symbolism and in the very structure of the church. Our eyes are drawn towards the altar. It's the highest point in the church, the closest to God, both figuratively and literally. Come again. I love the progression that we see here as we travel up the nave. There are the great I am windows. I am the bread of life. 
I am the door, I am the living bread, I am the good shepherd, I am the vine, the truth, and the way, and I am the resurrection and the life. And the pulpit is where we explore God's Word. Again, it's a beautifully carved work. There's the crucifix again, and two figures on either side. One is the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the other is St. John. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this little crucifix before either. I find this a very poignant object. It reminds me that I am under the authority of the crucified Christ, and that the words I speak in this pulpit are not to my glory or any other person's. They are to the glory of God. But perhaps my favorite symbol in the whole of the church is this one here, the great rood cross at the top of the chancel steps. Apparently the pointed ends of this Latin cross represent the suffering of Christ at his crucifixion. To me, it seems to mark yet another part of our Christian journey. We enter the church and we encounter the sacrifice and love of Christ. We share the word together and we're drawn to the supper of the Lord as we look to the chancel steps. And on our way, we pass under this root cross that reminds us both of Christ's suffering, but also of his triumph. Now we're here in sanctuary and you can see the beautiful memorial windows and they were given in memory of parishioners. The angels in the windows play the lute and the harp or the lyre and the horn and the cymbals as I imagine they do in the heavenly realms, at least I hope so. And I've had a long time to think about this because I spend a lot of time in sanctuary as one of the priests of the church. And I really think that these instruments are a reflection of that great psalm of praise, Psalm 150. And here, as I sit here in the empty church, I can hear the beautiful setting, my favorite, by Charles Villiers Stanford of Psalm 150. Oh, praise God in his holiness. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him in his noble acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him in the sound of the trumpet. Praise him upon the lute and the harp. Praise him in the cymbals and the dances. Praise him upon the strings and the pipe. Praise him upon the well-tuned cymbals. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Being a musician myself, I find these windows particularly meaningful. I love that they're in the chancel and in sanctuary, and that the angels are making music in the Holy of Holies. There's another part of the church that's really interesting, and it's perhaps a hidden part hidden part of the church, but also a hidden part of the religious history of our city. See, we're in the chapel here. Apparently, it was originally built as the choir robing room, but in 1936, it was refitted as the chapel. This rather large sculpture here behind me, carved from a single piece of white Carrara marble, is called the Calvary. Now, if the sculpture looks oversized for the chapel, it's because it was originally sculpted to be a wayside cross, and it was first situated in the parish garden. It was housed under a wooden canopy, which apparently had an inscription on it that read, God so loved the world. Toronto was a pretty Protestant place in those days, and the statue situation outside the church apparently caused some controversy. According to the parish history, the Toronto Star commented on it saying that it was a public declaration of an Anglo-Roman cult. To save it from any kind of damage from protests, the parish decided to move it inside. And so we have this magnificent, almost life-sized crucifix next to the altar. I rather like it, and also like the slight rebelliousness of its Catholicity. The chapel itself has had its ups and downs, its wet spells and its dry spells. But I think it looks rather beautiful in its present iteration. It's simple, 
it's rustic, and it feels honest. I'm really glad that you've come on this journey with me. And I pray that the parish of St. Martin's will continue to serve many generations of faithful people in this neighborhood. May we all continue to bring Christ's light and love into the world.